بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. The sixth integral is observing the mentioned order. According to that, if four people pour water on someone's wudu organs at once, while he intended, then the only validly washed part was his face, because he did not observe the order. However, if one were completely underwater, submerged, he can validly estimate that his face is washed, then his arms, then his head, then his feet, even if that took one moment. So there's a difference there between those two cases. According to the Shafi'is, there are several points of evidence that the order, the sequence, is an obligation, as opposed to the Hanafis who said that the order in wudu is not obligatory. The Hanafi said the order in wudu is sunnah. One, it could be that in the verse, the conjunction, which is the wow, which means and, proves the order of wudu. Yani. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَاغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ If you stood to pray, wash your faces. وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ And your hands. What? The wow here. إِلَى الْمَرَافِقُ وَامْسَحُوا وَامْسَحُوا And wipe. بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ Upon your heads. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ And wash your, fe- your feet. إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ To the ankles. According to this, the wow promotes order and sequence. That's a saying. But that one is disputable. That's not really a proof against the Hanafis there because it's easy to show that wow doesn't have to mean sequence. So some said that, but there's other proofs too. If the conjunction in the verse is not evidence for the sequence, the evidence is found in the doing of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For it was for it is only narrated from him that he made wudu in the order mentioned in the Quran. It was never reported that he made wudu out of order. Uh But you see, though, that's still not a definitive evidence. You have two types of proofs, brothers and sisters. You have a proof called a definitive, dalil al-qat'i, definitive evidence. It's undisputable, undisputable evidence. And you have another type of proof called dalil al That means it's a speculated evidence. Yani... According to the one who's using it as evidence, it's evidence. But someone else might have a perspective to the contrary of that evidence. So then it's not definitive evidence. So that first one is a clear case that's not a definitive evidence. Second one here is that the Shafi'i said another proof for the order in wudu is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only made wudu in order. Yani it was never reported about him that he did it out of order. Additionally, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَبِدَأُوا بِمَا بَدَأَ اللَّهُ بِهِ Start with what Allah started in the Qur'an. And the verse starts with washing the faces. This hadith is about hajj. When I say it's about Hajj, means that's the context in which the Prophet was speaking, the story behind what he was talking about when he said this. But the words themselves are general. And the rule is that the religious judgment follows the wording, not the reason why the Prophet said it. Not the reason why the Prophet said it. That's not the proof. Why the Prophet said it is not the proof. What he said is the proof. 
So when he said something that's general, then the rule from it is general, even if he was talking about something in particular. Start with what Allah started in the Quran. And the verse of wudu starts with washing the faces. So that's the first apparent integral. A fourth proof is that also in this verse, Allah ordered for four things of two types. Four things and two types. Yani. Those four things are divided into two types. What must be washed and what must be wiped. So what are the four things that are mentioned in the ayah? Washing the face, washing the hands, wiping the head, and washing the feet. Four things. Out of these four things, there's two types. One type that's washed, one type that's wiped. So, in the speech of the Arabs, which is how the Qur'an was revealed, things of one category are not separated by what is not of their category unless there is a reason. In this case, it is to prove an obligatory order for wudu. Meaning, okay, there's four things mentioned in the ayat. Those four things are broken into two categories. What's washed and what's white. However, Three of those four things are washed, and one of them is wiped. So the speech of the Arabs is not to interrupt things that are similar with something that's dissimilar. The speech of the Arabs is to mention similar things together and then mention a different category of things separately. Unless there's a reason, unless there's a reason to interject something different in between similar things. And that's what happened here in this ayah. Something is washed, something is washed, something is wiped, and something is washed. Wash the face, wash the hands, wipe the head, wash the feet. So what's the reason for interjecting a different kind in between? In this case, according to the Shafi'is, it is to prove an obligatory order for wudu. Also, this verse is clarification of the obligatory wudu. And that is why none of the optional recommended matters were mentioned in the ayah. The ayah only talks about obligatory parts of wudu. Yani everything about this ayah for wudu is about the obligation only. And that is why none of the optional recommended matters were mentioned. It then follows that the mentioned order is obligatory. It is sunnah to pray after making wudu. Even if it's a sunnah. Yani, you make wudu, pray with that wudu. If you pray an obligation with that wudu, then you fulfill the sunnah that we're talking about. And if you pray a sunnah with that wudu, then you fulfill the sunnah. So it is sunnah to pray after making wudu. One can intend, I now pray. Or one can intend prayer. And then pray two cycles or two units just for the sake of having made wudu. If he makes wudu and prays any obligatory or sunnah prayer, he got the sunnah. Uh, any question? Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Shaykh, is there like a time? Frame that you have to pray after the wudu? No. Is it like, okay. No, just pray with that wudu. I mean, so for example, 
Don't make a new wudu on top of that one if you didn't even pray with it yet. Or you might pray really quick before you break it if you're not really holding it strongly so that you don't miss praying with that wudu. To clarify, so even if you don't break wudu, you should renew it. But before making a new wudu, you should break that wudu. No, 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 no. Yani, uh, you have your wudu. So then, is it sunnah to make another wudu on top of the wudu you have if you prayed with it already? Yes. You already prayed with the wudu that you have. Then it is sunnah to make a wudu on top of it. If you haven't, then it's not sunnah to make wudu on top of your wudu. And if you break your wudu, it's sunnah to make it immediately. That's a high sunnah. That means as soon as you finish going to the bathroom, always make it your habit. As soon as you finish going to the bathroom, as soon as you wake up, you just make wudu and you stay on wudu all the time. As soon as you break it, you make it again. That's powerful. May Allah make it easy for you to do that. And me too, Emmy. You said, I think I just got mixed up between when you doubt your wudu, that you should break your wudu or eliminate doubt and then redo your wudu. Yani, the basic rule is you ignore the doubt. If you are sure you had wudu and then you doubt it if you broke it, then you say, I have it. If you were sure you broke your wudu and you were doubting if you made it, then you say, I don't have it. And you ignore the doubt. That's the general rule. We have some details we'll build on top of that. And that's an important rule, too. Don't abandon it unless you want to subject yourself to the whispers of the devil. Meaning what? The rule is, if you were sure, if you were sure you had wudu, and then you doubted whether you broke it, the rule is what? Can you tell me, sister? If you were sure you had wudu, and then you doubted whether you broke it, then what's the judgment? You still have wudu, correct. So what some people will do, they will say, ah, let me make wudu just to be sure. Let me make wudu just to be safe. If you do that, then the devil will haunt you. Can you see that? Can you see how that works? If you do that, if you don't follow this rule and you make wudu just in case, sounds good, the devil's going to haunt you after that. Because now he knows that he can play with you. Now he knows that you're not strong enough to stick to the rule that you know. Okay. Section, the two hoofs. Washing the feet is better than the facility of wiping the two hoofs, like we said already, which is a replacement for washing the feet in obligatory or optional wudu. Not ghusl. Hoofs don't work for ghusl. Nor removing filth. Hoofs don't replace removing filth like if your foot bled. Hoofs are specific to this nation and permissible whether residing or traveling and without needing them. You don't have to even need to wear the hoofs to be allowed to use them. Even for the woman who does not leave home, there's nothing wrong with her using hoofs. And the sick who cannot walk, he can use hoofs. His hoofs don't have anything to do with him being sick and not being able to walk. Although the hoof must be durable and enabling constant walking, that's a condition. Must be durable and enabling constant walking. That condition there, it knocks socks out of the box, Yanni. Makes socks not valid for hoof. Because socks are not durable and do not enable constant walking. Also, 
some footwear that might be water resistant or waterproof altogether, but you're not able to constantly walk in them because they're like socks. So we saw something like that. We had some questions about some, like some socks made of scuba material, something like this. So it's water resistant. Uh, so, but might not be something you can walk in constantly. But then for something like that, you could solve your problem if you put a soul on it. Give it a soul. So it's it is tough and it's water resistant. It's not durable enough for constant walking. Maybe if you put a soul on it and then you can walk with it constantly, then it would be valid to be a chuf. Whether made of skin, yani leather, hair, cotton, or compressed material. You know, like a fez, you know, those red fez hats, it's compressed. So your chof could be made of leather or hair or cotton or compressed material. As long as those chofs are pure, not filthy, unlike untanned hide, you can't wipe untanned skin. And those chofs are covering all of what needs to be washed of the feet. What would you have to wash in wudu? Your chofs have to cover all of it. If the cover were less than what must be washed, then wiping is insufficient without difference in opinion. Or in other words, then there's a consensus that wiping is insufficient. If the cover were less than what would be washed, had you washed your feet, then there's a consensus that this wiping is insufficient, not valid. This cover's judgment is the reverse of the cover for nakedness. This cover, meaning this footwear, cover here, here means footwear. This cover, this footwear, this cover's judgment is the reverse of the cover for nakedness, for the awrah. Also, it does not have to block the color of the skin, your footwear. It could be transparent, Yani. That's different from what you use to cover your aura. Can't be transparent. And it must be sealed from the bottom and the sides, not the top. It's different from what you use to cover your aura. It has to be sealed from the top and the sides, not the bottom. So that helped you remember both rules there. The rule for covering your aura and the rule for the chof. They're reverse. So the chof has to be sealed from the bottom and the sides and can be open from the top. The aura cover has to be sealed from the top and the sides and can be open from the bottom. And the chof does not have to be blocking the color of the skin. While the cover for the aura has to be blocking the color of the hair and skin. You said even if water can get in from the top, well, if it's open for sure, water will get in from the top. So yes, it's not a condition that it's closed to be able to wipe on it. It's not a condition that no water can get inside of your shoe to be able to wipe on it. For example, Muhammad, what if you had some rubber boots, completely water resistant, waterproof rubber boots, and they enable you to walk consistently, right? So they're valid for hoofs. Okay, they might go up past your shins, but they're still open, aren't they? Isn't it, if the water is deep enough, it's going to still get inside? Follow my example. So those are still valid to be chufs. It's not a condition that the chuf is closed from the top. What is weighty is that the chuf must be water resistant. 
So here, resistant doesn't mean waterproof. Waterproof means no water gets through at all, whatsoever. Water resistant means it will resist water until a threshold. So what is weighty is that the hoof must be water resistant. That's another reason why socks can't be hoofs. So we got two reasons why socks can't be hoof. One is that they don't enable constant walking. And two is that they're not water resistant. Because normally a hoof prevents water seepage. So that's what has to be the condition for the hoof. Prevents water seepage. And what was mentioned in the religious texts is restricted to that norm. Question, if a woman wears transparent hoof, she has to cover her nakedness for praying or outside? Yes. So, when we said the hoof doesn't have to conceal the color of the skin, we don't mean for the validity of the woman's prayer. We mean for the validity of being wipeable, just for being valid hoofs. Just to be valid hoofs in and of themselves, they don't have to block the color of the skin. They could be transparent. But for the validity of the prayer, then a woman knows that she has to cover all of her body except her face and her hands from all directions except from beneath. The minimum is what is called wiping. Yani anything called. The minimum is anything called wiping. Uh, watch out for that when you learn fiqh. That it will be said in different cases, the obligation is to do anything called such and such. Anything that has that name. Like when you sit for prayer. The obligation is to do what's called sitting. Anything called sitting. But there's a sunnah way to sit. But the minimum obligation, that's another thing. So here, the minimum is anything called wiping. And has to be within the area of the foot that must be washed. But from the top, not underneath. Meaning you don't wipe the sole underneath. You wipe the top. The sunnah is to leave lines by spreading the fingers and to wipe the upper and lower hoof. The sunnah to wipe underneath, but wiping underneath alone is not sufficient. It's not a valid wipe of the hoofs. So it's sunnah to leave lines by spreading the fingers, not obligatory. Look how easy it is to get that extra reward. Just you wiping your hoofs, what are you going to do? Just open your fingers with an intention and leave lines. I wonder what reward would one get in the afterlife for that. May Allah enable us to see. Ameen. May Allah enable us to have it. Ameen. What is valid is to wipe both hoofs. So it's not valid to wipe one hoof only. Not, on, not one only. Unless the other foot were missing, then you only have to wipe one hoof. So what is valid is to wipe both hoofs while wearing both after complete purification. Yani, you need to have a complete purification. Yani, both of your hoofs have to be on after a complete purification. That means if one of your hoofs is on before complete purification, then you can't wipe on your hoofs. That's the Shafi'i school. That means what? You made wudu. You're making wudu. You wash your one foot and you put your boot on. And then you wash your other foot and then you put your second boot on. Can you wipe on those boots as hoofs like that? No, you cannot. It's not valid. In the Shafi'i school, that's not valid. 
So if one washed one foot, then put on a chuf, then the other, and then put on its chuf, or one broke his wudu before getting his foot into the second chuf, the wiping is invalid. Ash-Shafi'i documented that in Al-Um. Starting from the impurity after wearing the chuf, not from the time one wipes, nor from the time he wore his chufs. The resident wipes for a day and a night, and the traveler of a long permitted travel wipes for three. Yani, when does your time, or how long is your time, if you're a resident, a day and a night, 24 hours. If you're a traveler, three days and nights, 72 hours. When does that time start from the time of the impurity? After wearing the chuf, of course. After you put your chufs on. So you uh, put your chufs on after you completed your wudu. Your time starts from the time of the impurity after wearing your chufs that were on after a complete wudu. Not from the time of wiping. That's not when your time starts. Not from the time of putting on the chufs, from the time of the impurity. Then if you're a resident, you get a day and a night. And if you're a traveler, you get three days and nights. The source of that is the hadith of Abu Bakrah, that the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave the facility for the traveler to wipe for three days and their nights. And for the resident, he gave one day and night. If one performs purification and then wore his khufs, he may wipe upon them. That's the hadith. The Messenger of Allah gave the facility for the traveler to wipe for three days and their nights. And for the resident, he gave one day and night. If one performs purification and then wore his khufs, he may wipe upon them. So there, look what he found there in the hadith. If one performs purification, then wore his khufs. He may wipe upon them. So that's the Shafi'i school. You have to have a complete purification and then put your chufs on. If one wiped while residing and then traveled, or he wiped while traveling and then resided, he continues wiping as a resident. Yani, you were residing, so you had 24 hours. You started wiping. And then you embark on a travel, you still just get to complete that 24 hours that you started. Unless you want to make a new wudu, take those chufs off, make a new wudu, wash your feet, and then put your chufs back on. Now you're, after you started your travel, now you get your three days after you break your wudu, that is. So if one wiped while residing, then traveled or he wiped while traveling and then he resided so you were a traveler wiping you get your three days but then you stop traveling before using your three days so if you had any 24 hours left if you had something of your original 24 hours left then you can continue now that you've resided, you can continue until the end of that 24 hours. If one wiped while residing, then traveled, or wiped while traveling, then resided, he continues wiping as a resident. The synopsis is that this wiping has four prerequisites. Complete purification, that they cover what must be washed to be suitable for wiping, and that the hoof be pure. Hence, it is not valid to use a chuf made from untanned skin. We said that. The source for its permissibility is what was narrated by Muslim from the route of Jarir, that he said, I saw the messenger of Allah go to urinate, then he made wudu and wiped on his two chufs. The hadiths about wiping the chufs, whether sayings or doings of the Prophet wasallam, are so numerous that they reached Tawatur, successive mass narration. 
Al Hassan al Bisri said, seventy companions told me that the prophet told me that the prophet wiped over the khufs. Those whom their consensus has any consideration had a consensus that it is permissible to wipe on the khufs. No one opposed this but the Mu'tazila. Okay, let's stop there, inshallah.